This is a uh, uh, history of France, uh, 1871 to the present, and I'm, my name is Merriman, and uh, we meet uh, Monday and Wednesday in this room, which is a pretty good room. And we, th the third, the famous third uh, se uh, hour to be arranged is a section. Uh, at the moment, we have been assigned four TAs, though looking around, we won't need four TAs. But at the moment, uh, we have Dain Yu, we have Michael Verman, we have uh, Andre Ivan I Ivanovo, and we have uh, Brian Riley. And um, knowledge of, of French or, or anything at all about France is not required in this class at all. Some of you had my introductory class, a lot of you haven't. Uh, a couple of you have had the, the first half of this course. Uh, most of you haven't. Many of you won't be here the next day. Uh, that's the, the what happens with the shopping period, and then the third day we see how many folks we have. We do have, for those people who want to take it, Travaux dirigés en français. Donc, uh, we have a section that's French speaking. Uh, it's an idea that uh, Chris Miller in the French department and I came up with in the late 90s, and my old dear friend Dick Broadhead uh, provided the funding. And what this is, is that I if you want to take the section in French, uh, I, you know, you should have about an equivalent of 130. Uh, and the discussions in French and a couple of the books, I'll talk about them in a minute, are, are you can read in French, the others you read in English. And it's not, you know, it's not a la-di-da thing where, where I mean, I'll, t I'll tell you once, there was uh, a student in there who had really fantastic uh, French, and I said, why is your French so good? And, and the person looked at me and said, well, the maid was from Dijon. You know, and another time somebody's French was very good, and I said, why is your French so good? Well, you know, mommy used to take us to Chamonix for the, pour uh, les vacances d'hiver. <laughs> and it is, you know, or, you know, our apartment next to the uh, Tour Eiffel was, uh, gave me contact with the French people. Um, <laughs> and so uh, it's not like that, I, I assure you. It truly isn't. And you're not, you're not counted uh, off for, uh, you know, for errors that you make in, in writing either, uh, if you're writing in French, and it really rocks. Trust me, we've done this for year after year. One year we actually had something like 42 people signed up and the course was much bigger. Uh, and we thought they all thought they were getting a free prize or something for signing up. There were so many of them. We ended up with about 32. We've had as few as eight. As long as we have five, it will, it, it will go. But it's a lot of, there's, it's really fun. And uh, you'll know people around here if you're uh, above a first year student who have taken this and it really rocks. It's really great. Uh, and Brian Riley is gonna, going to do this. He's from the French department. So I would encourage you, if you have, uh, have that kind of interest, to, uh, 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 to do that. Um, and you won't regret it. There's never been anybody who regretted doing it. Um, and it's, it's just a lot of fun. The other sections will meet in English. Uh, and uh, you know, usually what we do in this course is we offer some night sections because people are kind of busy. And so we, there'll be certainly a section Wednesday at 7, certainly one Wednesday at 8. Uh, there'll be certainly uh, a sections uh, Thursday at 1.30 and 2.30. And the French section is tentatively scheduled for, what did we say? We said Wednesday at 1.30. Isn't that it? Or something like that. It all shakes down. And it is fun. Now, what, are, what, you, know, what do you got to do in the course? Well, be, we have to come with good humor, and that I hope you'll have. Um, come to the lectures, and do the reading, see the films, which I'll talk about in a while, and go to sections, uh, and uh, hopefully participate in sections. And the sections tend to be fun uh, in uh, this course. So um, as so far, I know you're dying to know about midterm and final and those wretched things. I wouldn't give a midterm because I think it's a waste of time, except we have to. Um, have some sort of, it gives you an indication uh, how you're doing in the course. If you screw it up, we don't count it as much as if you do well. Um, and uh, the final is, we, we will give you on the last day of class, the questions for the final. We give you six questions. And we will ask you on the day of the final to respond to three of those, our choice. It would be hardly sporting if you got to pick the three. Um, and um, we also give you an oral exam option that uh, if you want to, say, not be here on uh, Christmas morning, uh, taking your last final, because they tend to go to the 23rd, you can just blow off those days and go off to Bermuda or go home or do whatever you do uh, and take the oral final, which we used to cheat and have it during reading period, but they caught on to me, and you can't do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, they frequently catch on to me. But so now we have it on the first two days of, of, uh, of uh, the final exam period, and you sign up for uh, it is not an interrogation, it is a friendly exchange about the themes of the course. 
Most people, particularly in this course, do that. But it's not a, a necessarily an advantage to do it. People, who, this is not the course, if they're doing, working hard on this course as in the one out of five they're blowing off, uh, then they tend to do that. And, and, and instead of writing for three and a half hours and getting writing cramp, and inevitably our final exam was in that horrible place, Osborne Hall, where you're sort of tilting like this, like you're leaning out of an airplane. And you sit up there for three and a half damn hours, you know, writing your brains out, and, and, and you can have a sporty conversation of 25 minutes with, with uh, uh, one of the teaching assistants, and you're out of there. So uh, that's what a lot of people do. In fact, uh, about two thirds of the folks do that. I have some very funny stories about those, but now is not the time to do that, especially because we're being filmed. But uh, <laughs> most people do, 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 uh, 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 do very well. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the reading. Uh, the books are available at, at uh, the Yale Bookstore, store Barnes & Noble. Here you guys, here's some of these. Um, and the textbook is a good textbook. It's really good in cultural history. Uh, a guy called uh, Chip Sourwine, Charles Sourwine, who's a buddy of mine from, uh, lives in Melbourne, in Australia. Um, and um, it's a good book. And the other books are, in their own way, sort of classics that you'll enjoy. Now, many of you, if you've had French anything, have read Germinal. And if you haven't read Germinal, uh, now is your chance to read it. Uh, Zola was one of the first great naturalist writers. And he would go up to the Nord, to the Anzin, to the mines of Anzin, up here in the north of France, uh, and he would go down in the mines and see how people worked. He would see how 15-year-old girls worked in the mine, Catherine, who grows up uh, uh, rather quickly in the mines. And it, it, it's a, a germinal means the budding. It, it's, a, it's a reference to a calendar of the French Revolution. It also kind of implies hope, and it's about what happens when people try to mobilize these these brave guys, you know, these these workers in in in, uh, uh, in in the mines. And, and if you've never read it, I mean, it's a great great uh, a novel. Um, a Life of Her Own is a book that I became obsessed with about uh, oh about five or six years ago. Um, Emily Carr was born in abject poverty in the High Alps, in the Hautes Alpes, uh, near uh, the Département of uh, in the Hautes Alpes, uh, near near Gap, up up really high in the mountains here. And um, she became a school teacher uh, as a common sort of uh, means of social ascension for a poor person from a village. She was born right near the Italian border, but just in abject poverty. She married an anarchist from the department of the Aldash, where we happen to live, or at least be legally residents and spend much of our time down here. And um, she moved from one school to the next. And when she was a very old lady, um, she led a demonstration to try to protect uh, the, the, her part, little part of France and the Italian border from being exploited by tourism. More about that at the end. And with her tractor, she led this demonstration. It was a phenomenal thing. And she ended up on this very famous French television show called Apostrophe uh, with Bernard Pivot, who said that she was one of the most interesting people that he'd ever had on the show. And she died in 1977. So, and she published her, her memoirs. It was called A, a Soup Made of, of Wild Herbs. And of course, it was translated into English with that title, and then they changed it to, uh, uh, what did they change it to in, in English? A Life of Her Own. And it's about being a young girl and a woman, uh, but it's an extraordinary thing. I became so obsessed with it that, that uh, uh, we drove up there so I could visit every school that which she had taught. And we actually found somebody who, were, we, we knew he, he wouldn't like her because he was sweeping out the church. He worked for one of the churches and she was very anti-clerical. So we actually met somebody who knew her and the school uh, is now named after her. But it's a wonderful, wonderful read. It's just, it, it's just it's great. My family got a little tired of this and said, do we have to, how many more of these places do we have to see in which this woman taught? But uh, uh, anyway, so we saw most of them. And then Henri Barbus, uh, who was a, a communist, uh, became a communist, who was a writer uh, in uh, World War I, and who served in World War I, and he wrote a great book, which is called Under Fire, that my dear friend and colleague Jay Winter has just written uh, uh, a, a new introduction for. And that's about the, the horrors of the trenches. It's just, you know, it's just the, the sheer, it's just, it's amazing, it's an amazing read, too. And then Mark Bloch. I once had the pleasure when I was giving a talk at the University of Strasbourg and sitting in Mark Bloch's office. Mark Bloch uh, taught people like me in uh, the way to do history. I mean, the people like me grew up on reading Mark Bloch, though I assure you he was much older than me. Uh, and he created a way of doing history called uh, the Annals School. 
And he, um, his first book actually was called uh, uh, The Healing Kings, because in medieval French times and medieval English times, when a king was crowned, there was this sense that if the king could cure you by touching you, excuse me for touching you, if you had scrofula, which is, one, uh, which is sort of a degenerative disease, it's hard to find people that have scrofula anymore, the king could touch the, the person and, and cure it. And it became part of sort of the, the, of the popular culture of royalty. And they, and they tried this in 1825 with disastrous results. Uh, but, but this was his first great book. And at the age of about 55, the war came along. And he wrote a book called Strange Defeat, explaining why in 1940 France fell so rapidly. And then he'd been, he was Jewish, and he was fired from his uh, post in Strasbourg under Vichy, that is the collaboration government of World War II, because he was Jewish. And then he caught on at the University of Montpellier, and then they realized that he was a Jew. So he was gone. Then he went back to a farm that he owned in the Limousin, in the Creuse, up here near a boring place I used to work called Guéret. And he um, sat around and thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something. So not at a horribly advanced age, I would like to think. He uh, went to Lyon, which was a capital of the resistance, because they have all these things called traboul in Lyon, which one reason, their passageways where you'd keep the silk, raw silk, dry. And so he, but he got set up by somebody, by a French person, more about this in a minute. And he was supposed to meet somebody on a bridge overlooking the Seine River. The, 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 the Lyon is at the confluence of the, of the Rhone and the Seine. You'll learn a lot about France in here, but if we don't ask you questions like that. What two rivers meet in Lyon? Uh, but he was set up, and he was hideously tortured here, and was killed. So Mark Bloch taught us, in a way, how to do history. But he also, writing this book, taught us how to think about the past and more about that in a minute, and how to think about what happened in France between 1940 and 1945. I do a seminar on that uh, uh, next semester. And then, and then what? And then I forgot one. I forgot to put one in. No, no, here it is. Sarah Farmer, who sat in the same class room, literally, when, before it was remodeled, uh, had wrote, written a wonderful book called Martyred Village, which first appeared chez Gallimard uh, in France. And it's about a village that I know very well, because I used to live in, in Limoges, uh, that in which uh, on the 10th of June, 1944, uh, the SS, German troops, came and simply slaughtered everybody. They shot the, the men and they put the women and the children in the church and they killed them. But what's interesting about that is why this particular village became the symbol for martyrdom in France. Why? Because it was thought to be virgin. There weren't resistors. There weren't collaborators. It was there. It was martyred. And uh, so she wrote this book. But what's more interesting than that is that the people who did the massacre in the SS, many of them were Alsatian. Now, Alsatians were French, even though many of them spoke German dialect. And so after war, the war, they said, we are the malgré nous. We were put on trial because, I mean, we were in the army because we were forced to be, because Alsace was annexed directly into Hitler's Reich. And um, when they were acquitted, only two people who were condemned from those forces, uh, they had joined voluntarily. And the other, the Malgré Nous, were the, the in spite of ourselves, were, um, were uh, pardoned. There were riots in Limoges that they were pardoned. There were riots in Colmar and in Strasbourg in Alsace that they had been condemned uh, at all. So identity, national identity, is very complex. And we talk about the war. Uh, this is a, you know, it's a sparkling, um, sparkling account. And what they did with this village, ghoulish you might say, is they left it just the way it is, or was, on the 10th of June, 1944. They left all the buildings blown up or caught on fire, and they have crosses where people were shot. And there was a, used to be a ghoulish museum with a knife opened up that indicated that they tried to defend themselves. And then now they put in a centre de mémoire, sort of a memory site there that's kind of slick, but it's fine. A friend of mine who's a senator is the president of it there. But they kept that village just the way it was, and they built one next to it. And about 1952, some people about your age uh, started to party. And somebody came up with a gun and said, we don't party in order sur glane. So imagine growing up in a place like that where the past was so 
was written not only in the death of people that you knew, because everybody you knew died, basically. One woman got out. She went through the, 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 uh, the, the there was a veto, a, a window behind the altar, and she was able to get out. Anyway, so those, the, the, the reading is great. So what, what can I say? I'm slightly biased, but uh, the reading uh, is great. The reading rocks. Now, what about the films, the movies? Um, inevitably, there is paths of glory. Les Sentiers de la Gloire. If you've never seen it, it's a Kirk Douglas movie that's a good movie, uh, and it's about the mutinies on the Western Front, and it's very, very good. We used to say, well, come to 101, and the, it'll be filmed at, at uh, we've shown it at 8 p.m. or something, but nobody ever does that. They all watch it in the privacy of their rooms, uh, or you can go watch it. We'll figure it out. But the, it, it's a really uh, wonderful movie. Uh, and then, uh, you'll see a film called Au Revoir Les Enfants. Sort of, see ya, children. Goodbye, children. How many have seen Louis Malle's Au Revoir Les Enfants? Bah, many of you have seen it. It's a great film. It's a true story. It's about Fontainebleau, which is south of, uh, uh, southeast of Paris, sort of a fancy place. And it's about his childhood when he was in college. College is middle school. You learn about French schools. My kids have been in French schools for many years, so, they, so I, I know about these places. Um, and he, there was a, someday, one day this boy showed up in the class. This is during Vichy. It's about 1943. Maybe it's 44. And he's new and he's, he's not different. He's just not from there. He's obviously from, uh, from Paris. And he was Jewish. And it's about the attempt, to, I mean, the, the role of the Catholic Church in, in uh, Vichy is not a, a very savory one, the French hierarchy, uh, and many priests, but many priests were very heroic. And when this particular priest, who was a real live guy called uh, Père Jean, Father John, uh, tried to hide this boy in, in the school so he wouldn't be arrested and sent off to the camps. But he was denounced by somebody who was in the militia, the milice, what's called, which is sort of a paramilitary thugs that worked for Vichy, and of course it does not have a happy, happy ending. And then the last film, uh, most of you won't, won't have seen it, called La N, Hate. I guess you would translate that as hate, or hatred. And it's a, I'm very interested in what happened in the French suburbs two years ago. In fact, I wrote an instant article on it for an encyclopedia because uh, uh, some of the work I'd earlier done it was about the why French suburbs and European suburbs are different than American suburbs. American suburbs, many of you come from them. Hillsboro, California, uh, Darien, Connecticut, Gross Point, Michigan, places like that. That's not what the suburbs are in Europe. Suburbs are where people unwanted by the center go. And the fear of the suburbs has been something that, by the, the prosperous center, has been a very long, important theme in French history, particularly written in Paris. And I'll talk more about that. And La N, which was a small budget movie, became this great success. And it's a tough movie to watch. It's tough. It's verbally tough to watch. And it'll have subtitles, but it's, it, it was done in 1996 or 97. But it's, uh, uh, it's, it's really superb. So what kind of, don't want to give everything away, but what kind of themes do we have in, 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 a course, uh, uh, in, in a course like this? What have I forgotten about? Oh, me. Uh, um, I'm Merriman, I said that. Uh, I still am, actually. Uh, and and it, sometimes I feel, after a day like yesterday, that, that I, I've, I'm sort of, I, I'm not. But anyway, uh, I, my office hours are, um, when are my office hours? Uh, Monday, 1 to 3, in Branford College, where I was master long ago, K13, Branford College. And I'm also, like everybody else, on emails. And I'll get your emails, panicked emails, at 3.10 in the morning and I'll reply at 4.45. So it goes, like, it goes like that. What kind of themes? Let me talk a little bit about some of them. Let me just talk about, oh, about three or four of them, just so you can see what hopefully you'll be getting yourself into. And you'll have fun. You'll learn a lot about France. I'll tell you that. Okay, one theme I'm interested in is, um, well, let me tell you about lectures, first of all. I do not do chronological lectures. Well, in, a in 1882, and then it was followed by 1883. I don't do that. I lecture about what, I'm, what I like to talk about, what's interesting that will hopefully make you understand what the big issues are uh, in all of this. So that's why it's a good thing to, uh, to come to lecture and also to uh, read the books. But one of the things I'm interested in is national identity. And, and in fact, because we kind of have you know, complex uh, 
uh, you know, attitudes toward our own identity, I suppose, me and, and my family. But um, if you took, and a few of you have heard me say this before, so forgive me. Uh, in 1789, if you tried to guess how many people uh, spoke uh, French in France, you might come up with 80% as a guess or 90 or, or whatever. It was about 50%. Some people were bilingual. So what did they speak? Uh, uh, well, I mean, if you want to remember, we'll start anywhere you want. It, Breton, which is a language that has nothing to do with French at all, here. Oh, I've got a really funny story, but I don't want to tell you about, tell you about Bre a Breton priest, in, in a French-speaking Breton priest, but that's enough for another day. Anyway, uh, they spoke Breton here. Now Nantes isn't considered technically part of Britain, Brittany, but they spoke Breton there, uh, which is uh, basically a Gaelic uh, language. And then if you go up, you think, well, they spoke French there, uh, certainly in Normandy, but they spoke in many parts of, parts of a Patois. In about 1844, this kind of crazy guy took a big knife and he slit the throat of his mother and his two sisters. And uh, they were, the police were looking for him, and he was from Normandy. He lived near Caen in, uh, you know, in Normandy. And they found him eating you know, uh, clams and things for survival on the beach, and they had to bring in a translator somebody to translate him. Before he was guillotined, uh, he, he dictated his life. The, the book uh, 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 Michel Foucault, a famous philosopher, uh, got a hold of uh, and wrote a preface for it. In French it was, Moi, Pierre Rivière, ayant égorgé ma mère et mes deux sœurs. And me, uh, Pierre Rivière, having slit the throat of my, my mother and my two sisters, I'm going to tell it like it was. And he did. Uh, but they had the, the important thing is that they had to have a translator for him in the 1840s. Uh, when Bernadette of Lourdes, in 1856, uh, believed that she saw the Virgin Mary, of course they had to have somebody come and translate there uh, what was a mountain patois influenced by, uh, by, by Spanish. Uh, but if we'll move north here, up here, it, there were a lot of people uh, spoke Flemish, very few now. Uh, you don't have to know this, it's just kind of fun. Uh, I, I mean, I love it, but anyway. Uh, and then in parts of Lorraine, they spoke a German dialect that's very much like what's spoken in, in Freiburg. In Alsace, almost everybody, as you will see later, uh, spoke German dialect. But it didn't mean if you ask somebody, are you French? And they were the reply in German, yes, I'm French. You know, that doesn't, language doesn't necessarily tell you how people feel about their identity. Some sage once said, I don't know who it was, but I love this expression. Um, that a language is a dialect with a powerful army. Look at Spain. Why was Catalan illegal to publish until Franco croaked in 1975, clutching the left elbow of saint Therese of something or other? Because Castille, Spanish-speaking Castille, with its command economy, had conquered the Basques and conquered, uh, conquered uh, the Catalan. And so, um, uh, all this will, will change and, 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 you know, during this period. Or if you move further down, you get into uh, Savoie, which was uh, uh, Savoy, Savoie, Haute Savoie, et Savoie, which were, were uh, annexed in 1860, and they spoke in essentially Piedmontese. They spoke an Italian uh, a language. If you go to Provence, then, Provençal is a written language. Uh, you know, you get a sense of that if you see a really great movie like Jean de Florette, you know, with the inevitable Gerard Depardieu is in every single film made, this side, <laughs> this side of Disneyland, he, Disney World, he is there. Uh, but with Daniel Otoy, who was fantastic, he had to put one of those things that dentists put in your mouth when they're going to give you a, uh, an x-ray to make you feel uncomfortable in order to pronounce perfectly this, this, this Provençal language. It, and it's not just the accent of ang, you know, quatre vanga or ang, enfin instead of enfin. Uh, it's, it's, it was, it's a whole language. And moving along here, you get down to Catalonia. This French Catalonia speaks the same. We still own, own, know old ladies down there who speak Catalan. Same language spoke down all the way to Valencia, at least along the coast. You move in here, you go to Basque country. Besides all the patois, you go to the Basque country. Basque is only remotely related to Finnish and to Magyar, to Hungarian. Uh, and then you, uh, you know, got all these, you've got Auvergne Patois here, you've got Limousin Patois, you've got all these languages. So the only point of the interest about this is that when do people start thinking that they're French as opposed to from a certain family, from a certain village, from a certain region? Uh, when do they start seeing themselves as French? And this has been hotly debated in the literature for a very long time. There are still people now that live, there's a woman that lives near our village 
uh, and she's lived in our village. I mean, she was born in the next village, and she's lived in our village for 40 years because she married a guy from the village. And she's from the next village, about 20 football throws away, or more, a little more than that. And uh, somebody, as a joke, once asked her, how do, how do you feel living in this village after all these years? And she said, oh, sometimes I get homesick. Uh, there's a sense that she's, she'll never be from the village, she's from somewhere else. But sometime between 1750 and maybe 1990, most, almost everybody in France began seeing themselves as French. And the schools play a major role in this, and thus all these kids who grew up speaking Patois or Provençal or Gascon, I forgot Gascon, uh, around Bordeaux, uh, they uh, can sing the Marseillaise in acceptable French as they march off to be slaughtered. Uh, when, do people, and it's, when do peasants become Frenchmen, as someone posed? And, and it's an interesting question because it tells you a lot about, you know, uh, about uh, uh, regional uh, identity and about national identity. And the role, the role of the schools is important in that because what happens is that the Virgin Mary gets elbowed off the walls by Marianne, the female image of the Republic. And that's, that it starts with the French Revolution, but it's a very long process. So we'll talk some about that, but not that much. Um, I guess the, the, the other two themes I want to discuss, uh, and not in great detail, uh, but uh, are, you know, are the wars. I mean, obviously, World War I is, unleashes the demons of the 20th century. Nobody could have anticipated that all these empires would collapse. Anti-Semitism was out there before that in Germany and France, as you'll see with the Dreyfus Affair, all sorts of places. But uh, World War I transformed Hitler uh, from a man who hated social democrats, who hated socialists, into a man obsessed with killing Jews. World War I has an enormous impact on, on the way people viewed themselves in uh, France and in everywhere. Everybody knew people who died in the war. It was the defining experience of the 20th century, and the violence of the war continues into the 1920s and 30s. So you can see the whole period until 1945 is an even more horrible 30 years war than that of the 17th century. There are 35,000, 36,000 communes in France, that is administrative units. Paris is a commune, but so is a village of uh, 12 people is a commune. 36,000. In World War I, only 12 didn't have somebody killed. France in the 1920s was a country of widows dressed in, in, in black, of people missing limbs or coughing their lungs out from the poison gas if they were lucky enough to survive, putting huge strains which, uh, you know, on, on welfare systems. Obviously, it was very important that they be taken care of in a country in which the birth rate had stopped in most of the country in the mid-19th century, unique in the world. Uh, there weren't enough men to go around. They were dead. You can go into villages and in towns almost anywhere, particularly in the lower Massif Central down here, and you can find uh, in towns of, of just tiny, tiny towns, 74. I, I, I'm a counter. I count things all the time. It drives me crazy. Uh, uh, you know, I'll count up the number of people killed in every you know, church that I go to visit to look at. And it, it's simply extraordinary. We can't even imagine uh, what that's like. There are only three people left in Britain who fought in World War I, only three, and they're about 110 years old or something uh, like that. But it, it's, it's difficult to, to, to understand uh, the, what the impact was in the poisoning of the political uh, atmosphere. Uh, th uh, we'll talk about the Battle of the Somme, S-O-M-M-E. In the Battle of the Somme, uh, in the first day of the Battle of the Somme, the 1st of July, 1916, there were 20,000 British soldiers killed. In the first three days, just counting the British, there were more British soldiers killed and seriously wounded than there were Americans killed in World War I, Korea, and Vietnam combined in three days comparable chilling effects in Russia uh, and in Britain and in Austria-Hungary as well. Where was the flower of English youth, this used to say? Well, they were hung up on that old barbed wire. They were dead. 
and your life expectancy wasn't very good because of foolish military uh, uh, decisions, because of a war that ended up being the war fought in which no one outside of a few people who had seen the Russo-Japanese War around Mukden could have ever imagined. Uh, we, you know, the, the finest, some of the finest books on any topic are those uh, of history are those on World War I. The Great War and Modern Memory uh, of the British, of Siegfried Sassoon, about Siegfried Sass uh, Sassoon and Wilfred Owen, who's, uh, whose mother got the news that he'd been killed on the day of the armistice. Uh, you know, there's an extraordinary literature. The, the, the close uh, concurrent, the close uh, competition for that uh, richest literature would be the Spanish Civil War with Orwell and Borkenau and, and Brennan. But we'll talk a lot about World War I, how it started, what it meant, and what the impact was. And there's nowhere you can go in northern France where you're not just awash with, uh, with, uh, with military cemeteries around Reims there, anywhere up in the Inn, near the Chemin des Dames. These are battlefields in which, which every day, in fact, at the Battle of the Somme, there's one casualty for every meter of the entire front of, of the war, I mean, of, of that particular battle. I mean, it's really extraordinary. And it goes it went on and on and on. And we'll talk about the impact of what, what, what this happened. I mean, there are obvious impacts, but what happened on, on, uh, on, uh, on civil society and on politics. Where were the leaders of the 20s and the 30s? They were dead. They were dead. Killed at 18, killed at 19. I was in the British War Museum, Imperial War Museum the other day, and I'd been there four or five times, and I went, and just for the hell of it, they have a thing where you can look up dead people. Uh, and so I said, well, I wonder if there's somebody with my name who was killed, and there was. And my uncle had an extremely odd, my grandfather had an extremely odd name, and there was somebody of his name too that was killed. They all died. Uh, and it was, not everybody, but uh, in France, a million five hundred thousand people died, and that's a huge demographic chunk. It's like a big shark took a big bite out of your basic pyramid of, of your demographic uh, tree. And something like Hitler, I mean, this isn't a course on Hitler, but uh, it's from the other course, but uh, you know, why this guy who had no friends, who was just a pain, just a pain. He was so penible. He was such a pain. And he had one guy that he used to bore with, you know, his stories about architecture and painting and, and Wagner, whom he loved dearly. And in, it is, you could never imagine that he would be somebody that people would, would listen to on the radio hour after hour, because that's how long he talked. Or that when Stauffenberg tries to kill him in 1944, that Germans would pour out of the, into the street to thank God for saving the Führer. Why did he become somebody Sig Heil? He was one of the guys. He was one of the guys. He was one of the guys. He'd been wounded three times, and he was a runner that he carried, you know, carried messages to the trenches from the generals who were all drinking champagne in their ass to the front. Uh, and he was wounded three times, and he was one of them. He had that, that, uh, that stamp of having been one of the guys, and the violence keeps going. You have to explain why all of this has happened, and you have to find people that made it happen, and it was the Jews, and it was the socialists, and it was the communists, and it was the homosexuals, and we'll kill them all. And that's what he did. And from the point of view of France, they emerged from the war with the reality that they are in victory, a weaker nation than Germany is in defeat. And so it's a big shadow over the whole damn thing. It's incredible. And Mark Bloch, when you read the collapse of France, it's, you know, it's very interesting. Interesting stuff. World War II. You know, I mean, I'll give you two stories. When I was in, um, working in a place called Tulle, which is down here, T-U-L-L-E, -L -L -E, not Tour, but Tulle, um, I knew vaguely that there had been a massacre there in uh, uh, June 6, 1944, and a lot of people had been hung. And I didn't have any money. You know, my kids would say, oh, Dad, not that I don't have any money story again. But I didn't have any money, and so I would have a, uh, you know, I, I, I would be eating ice cream, and I got to know this guy with my not very good French then, uh, and uh, we talked, and, and I said, were you, do you remember the day the Germans came back and hung all those people? And he said, yeah. I said, well, how did you get away? And he said, well, it's a tool, it's on a, it's a big valley, it's a real long town, and, and these houses have balconies like this. So he went up and he hid. He was 12, he would have been killed, 14, they didn't care, um, they didn't care. And um, one day, so I was eating my ice cream because the archives were closed, and this, this woman came up, and she was probably about 50 or something like that, and she ordered an ice cream, and so this guy says, well, you know, uh, Madame whatever, Madame Dupuis, uh, you remember that day, don't you, when the Germans came back? And she said, oh, I sure do. They hung my husband from that pole. And that pole was right next to, uh, 
uh, next to this ice cream stand in front of the theater in Toos. And uh, that was 1970. More about that in a second. And I have a friend, is a Parisian lawyer who works in, Af works in Africa a lot. And when he was a little boy, um, the Germans came to, to get his father, who was a Greek Jew, and he was taken away and killed, of course. And uh, one for shouldn't forget that the, the people who, re who re rounded up the Jewish children in the Marais, where lots of Jews lived, uh, were French. The Germans would have been happy to, were French police. They were French police. And his father was denounced by a, a policeman by a policeman. And after the war, that policeman directed traffic at the market every Saturday, and the widow walked by and saw this man, knowing he had denounced her husband who had been taken away and killed. Now in 1970, there was still this collective amnesia in France. The myth perpetuated by de Gaulle, the big guy, was that in France everybody had resisted except for a few elites. And then France had risen up to follow his great shadow and had thrown off the oppressor and founded a republic. In 1953, there was a documentary made about the deportation of Jews from Paris. And there was a film uh, made about this. They, this. they put together a documentary. And the, in one of the, f the, 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 one of the scenes, it's a camp place called Drancy, which is out near the airport, halfway to the airport, uh, to Wassy Airport. And there was a, a German, I mean, a French, a uh, gendarme who is guarding the German, I mean the French Jews, French gendarme guarding the French Jews, and they lifted him out of the movie. They literally took him off the screen. So if you see it, he ain't there. Why? Because the image was nobody collaborated or hardly anybody, and everybody resisted. Now that amnesia, which in part of it was de Gaulle didn't want to give the communists credit, because they were the party of 75,000 martyrs because they were organized and they resisted. Other people did too. There was a Catholic resistance. Uh, there was your Ga basic Gaullist resistance. I remember when de Gaulle died, I was in Paris. I was the only person frisk going into Notre, Notre Dame, literally, that I saw. They threw me up against the wall and checked me out, because I was a kid, and I, and I, I wanted to go there and see this, the, you know, just for the purpose of history of being there. But de Gaulle perpetuated this myth about the resistance, and then there were cracks in the myth. And the first crack was a movie that's so long that it used to be the, the janitors and people who clean these, uh, the very nice people who clean these rooms used to call it a two six pack movie because it was so long. It was, a, it was for, I'm not supposed to say that we're filmed, but, but uh, it was for, you could cut that baby out of there, but, but uh, uh, that it was, it's about a four hour a film and it's called The Sorrow and the Pity and it's about uh, Clermont Ferrand, which is in the Massif Central here. And there's some amazing scenes in it where they shave the heads of, of, of horizontal collaborators which is sort of a crude way of talking about you know, French women who slept with German officers, horizontal collaboration. Uh, and at the end of the movie, there was, uh, there was uh, uh, Maurice Chevalier. Maurice Chevalier was a crooner, he was a singer. He was a, if your parents knew about France, he was the person that your, your grandparents even had heard about. And he was somebody from a poor part of Paris, and from many montants, and he had this straw hat and he sung tunes, and very good, my boys, and all of this stuff. And at the end of the movie, he says, you know, there are these very bad rumors about me and uh, that I sang for the German troops and I want to tell you I only sang for the boys. That is the French, uh, that is for the French interned soldiers in, 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 in Germany then. You know, it may have been true or may, maybe not, but it made people start looking at the past. What really happened between 1940 and 1945 or 44, end of 44, what really happened? There was a trial of a very old man in 1998 about called Maurice Papon, tried in Bordeaux. And he did very well after the war. He had signed during the war all sorts of slips that sent Jews off to the station in the Gare Saint-Jean in Bordeaux to the train station to be shipped off to the east. But he did very well. He became a, a minor Gaullist official and he did very well. And they finally caught up with him. And he said, I'm a good bureaucrat. I did the, they were pleased with my work. I signed those fiches, those, those formulas, and if I hadn't been there to save the hundreds, then they all would have died. And he was, but you can't put somebody 90 years old uh, in, in the slammer. And so he was in kind of this very, very minimum security, and he finally just croaked a, 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 a while ago. At one point, he tried to, he escaped, actually, with the help of some friends, and they found him dining in an elegant Swiss restaurant. It was too, it was uh, trop beau. But anyway, um, so th the other thing that happened was a friend of mine, I'm very proud to say, called Robert Paxton, wrote a book called Vichy France. 
and he had to use captured German documents because the French documents weren't open. They were not available because the big secret of collaboration should not be known. And we're going through in France the same thing now with, uh, uh, with the War of Algeria too. But more about that later. So give me two more minutes. I'm going to end, and a few of you uh, faces have heard this before, people that I, I, I know. But um, I guess one reason why I'm in history, um, well, because I read a book a long time ago. I didn't know what else to do. Uh, and uh, I read, what, read one book that really influenced me, but I also read a poem. And this is kind of a, uh, you know, a signature, not my signature, but, but the kind of course it, it is. Because you're going to hear about, about De Gaulle, and you're going to hear about fancy people, uh, and, you know, uh, but you're also going to hear about very ordinary people who were caught up in kind of the torrent of the 20th century and the late 19th century. So let me just read you this poem. It is short, and it's a Brecht poem, and it's called A Worker Reads History. And then you can go home or go shop. Shop till you drop, whatever. Who built the seven gates of Thebes? The books are filled with the names of kings. Was it kings who hauled the craggy blocks of stone? And Babylon, so many times destroyed, who built the city up each time? In which of Lima's houses, the city glittering with gold, lived those who built it? In the evening, when the Chinese wall was finished, where did the masons go? Imperial Rome is full of arcs of triumph. Who reared them up? Over whom did the Caesars triumph? Byzantium lives in song, were all her dwellings palaces, and even in Atlantis of the legend, the night the seas rushed in, the drowning men still bellowed for their slaves. Young Alexander conquered India, he alone? Caesar beat the Gauls, was there not even a cook in his army? Philip of Spain wept as his fleet was sunk and destroyed. Were there no other tears? Frederick the Great triumphed in the Seven Years' War. Who triumphed with him? Each page a victory. At whose expense the victory ball? Every ten years a great man. Who paid the piper? So many particulars. So many questions. And if you hang around, which I hope you will, we'll get to the bottom of some of this. Have a good weekend. <laughs>